I have a message that I have really um, been blessed by preparing. I'm blessed by every message I think that I get to prepare. But this one has stimulated my thinking. I've spent this last week just pondering these thoughts and trying to work it out in my own mind as to how best to present to you what I'm going to give to you today. So I hope in the simplicity of the way that I'll present it that you will take that which is actually incredibly awesome, but at the same time is amazingly simple. And I want to try and combine this, the beauty of these two things together. We're in the book of Hebrews, and we're in the third session of this, so we're talking about better things. In the book of Hebrews, you see, you see Jesus compared to 13 times to something, and every time it either says it or impl implies Jesus is better. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He's better than, he gives us better things. He gives us better hope. He gives us a better covenant. So what I have to say today is going to follow on, and I hope you'll see the continuity of what I'm about to share with you. Today I want to talk about better promises. Better promises. I want to read to you chapter 8 of Hebrews from verse 6 through to verse 13. Let me read it to you. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one. This is a better covenant. We finished on that last time. And it is founded on better promises. Better promises. Then it goes on. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and I led them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant. And I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant, this is the new covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord. There's a turning point in spiritual history here. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the last of them to the greatest, for the least of them to the greatest, for I will forgive their wickedness, and I will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one, listen to this, by calling this covenant, I'm going to talk about it now, new, he's made the old one obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. It's all about better promises. You know, there's a couple of things come to mind when I think of the thing of promises. I think of, first of all, broken promises. And sadly, in the world today in which we live, many of us have suffered at the hands of people who have broken promises, and we understand the pain that goes with that, as God understood the pain in the first covenant, where they made promises and declarations that I will follow you, I will love you, I will be everything for you, God, and, and I will obey you, and they just broke their promises. And then you get better promises. You get promises, broken promises, and then you get better promises. That's what this one is. And the only reason to give a better promise is if it's better than the original one. Otherwise, if you don't give it, then it's either a promise or a broken one. But there is a better promise. For instance, I'm allowed to break a promise as long as it's a better promise. If I say to you, hey, hey you know, you know, I'm going to give you 10 rand. You know, I promise I'm going to give you 10 rand. And then two weeks later, I come to you and I say, no, 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 I'm going to give you a better promise, and I'm going to give you 100 rand. Rand. The second promise supersedes the first one. It is a better promise, and it makes you feel a whole lot better because it is exactly that. It's a better promise. The second promise has to be better than the first. Now, in the context of the book of Hebrews, this book is written to people who are under suffering terrible persecution. It is a book of incredibly deep theology. 
I don't know if I've found another book where there's just such, such depth of understanding and complicatedness and complexity about God and His nature. And it's, a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal book. And as I look at this, I'm saying, well, if there's a second promise that is better than the first one, what was the first promise? Well, the passage tells us that's not difficult. The first promise is what they call the Old Covenant. It comes from the Old Testament, basically. And the Old Covenant ran up until the time when Jesus came, and Jesus changed everything into now the New Covenant. That's the simplest way to look at it. Two periods of history, written history as well. Old Testament, right the way through the patriarchs, the prophets, the kings, everybody came. And at the end of that, when everybody had failed and broken the promises to God, then God says, guys, this is not working. It's not working. Every promise I make to you is great, but you keep messing up the promises. Therefore, I'm going to make a new covenant with you. I'm going to make a new promise to you. And the new promise that I make to you is going to be a whole bunch better than the old one that I made before. Now, if I were God... I would say, let me just punish you for not obeying the old covenant. But because God is so gracious and God is so kind and God is full of love and mercy and gentleness and, and beauty, he says, even though you have failed, I acknowledge your inability to fulfill the first covenant. You'll never pull it off because you have to pull it off perfectly in order to qualify for the blessing. Because with the old covenant, there was always a blessing associated with the obedience to the first covenant. If you read in the book of Joshua, and I, wish, I was going to read it, go and read Joshua chapter, chapter 1, and you'll see how it's from verse 6 to verse 8. Write it down, go home and read it. Where God makes a promise to Joshua, but the, the fulfillment of the promise is determined by the fulfillment of their obedience. And God says to Joshua, Joshua, I will bless you. I will give you all the land that I have promised you. That was the old promise, but now I have a better promise. I'm going to be with you, and I'm going to help you, and I'm going to guide you, and you're going to take the land, man. And Joshua says, Lord, I'm not so sure about that. But God gave to him a better promise. He says, I will give you this. I will be with you. I will never forsake you. I will give you the land that I have promised to you. The only problem was the old covenant was still in existence. And God puts this qualifying thing there. He says, if, the big if. That's the old covenant. The old covenant revolves around a big if. That if you obey me, he says to Joshua, if you obey me, if the book of the law never departs from your mouth, if you follow my law, then the blessing will follow. That's the old covenant. It was determined and de depended upon your obedience to the book of the law. Now, it's a great ideal. But God understands our battle with obedience. He understands our sinful nature. And God said, you'll never pull this off, so I have a better covenant. His name is Jesus. That's the better covenant. And Jesus came, and he changed people. He changed everything. Everything. The old covenant was now no longer relevant Although there was good stuff in there that we can get and we can derive and we can learn some of the principles, I take nothing from that. But if you're living your life and hoping to get to heaven by obeying that, you're going to be lost because you'll never pull it off. And God says, you'll never pull it off. Therefore, I have to send you a better covenant, a better promise. His name will be Jesus. And he is the fulfillment of everything spoken of in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. His name will be Jesus. And Jesus changed everything. Now, that's good news. That's a better promise. Now, last week we spoke about how it gets even better than just having Jesus. Last week we spoke about the Holy Spirit because Jesus came as a better promise and Jesus gives, says, I'm going to give you an even better promise than just me. After I leave, I will give to you the Holy Spirit. He'll be a better promise. And so God is into giving better promises continually. The first promise of the covenant didn't work. He says, I promise you, Jesus, that will work. And in addition, to that, I'm going to give you a better promise. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit as well. And God is progressively giving us better promises. Now, Today, in order for us to be able to, to focus on what the old covenant looked like, I don't want to take too long on this, but it is important for you to realize what we're leaving behind, the old covenant. Now, I, I think this, is, this might be a, a help. You know, in the Old Testament, they had the Ark of the Covenant. 
The ark depicted everything about the Old Testament covenant that God had given to the people. And this is what it looked like. Phil, would you stick that thing up? This is what the ark of the covenant looked like. It was a box, 1,5 meters long by 750 wide by 750 deep. It was completely covered with gold. It was incredibly ornate. It had barometers. It had two long acacia, acacia um, sticks, poles that were covered with gold, and they would carry the ark. The priests would carry the ark. And then on the top, they had this gold plate, which was the covering. And on the top of that were two angels that stood staring down into the middle between them. And that was the mercy seat inside the box. There were three things there in the picture there. You see, there was the bowl of the manna that God supplied to them in the wilderness. It was a picture of God's abundance of God's willingness and ability to bless them physically. Inside there was Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod is depicting the nation being chosen. Because remember with Aaron how they, they, they would, the, the people had come and said, we don't like Moses and Aaron anymore. And so God said to the people, everybody from the, each tribe, bring one of your rods or one of your staffs. It's a great story. And they came, 12 of them. They put their rods in Moses' hands, and Moses laid them down. And God said, come back tomorrow, and I will show you which is the legitimate leader and the, the high priest. So they all went away, came back the next day, and Aaron's rod was not just blossoming, but it was already bearing fruit. Out of the dryness of that stick, God showed Aaron and Moses that they were the legitimate leaders of Israel. And so we see how God chooses people to do so. That's why he took the nation of Israel. That's why we, the church, are God's chosen people. And then you had the law, the two tablets of stone that Moses had to carve, and all the Ten Commandments were on that. And they put all of those inside of the Ark of the Covenant. And that was a most precious, holy book. And then God said this as he pointed toward the mercy seat, which you see between the two angels. And God says, and I will meet you here on the mercy seat. And so they would put the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of the temple. And the Ark of the Covenant would sit there all alone until once a year the high priest would come in. And he would bring blood and he would pour it upon the mercy seat. And he would come in fear and trepidation because he was coming into the very Shekinah presence of God. And he went through incredible ceremonial cleansing rituals and everything in order for him to be able to bring the blood. And it was just the blood of a sacrifice, and he would pour it on the mercy seat where God said, I will meet you here. That's the old covenant. It was dependent upon obedience. If you want to be blessed of God, you've got to obey God. And there's many aspects of that that might still be true today. But the beauty of what we see over here is simply depicted as this. Here we have another rendition of the Ark of the Covenant. And this is the Ark of the Old Covenant. But then we find that all of a sudden Jesus comes along and he says, I will no longer meet you here, but I will meet you here at the cross. And he will offer his own blood upon the mercy seat. And he will, I find this incredibly emotive, just can't believe it that Jesus, in a sense, pours his blood upon the mercy seat and offers it to his Father and says, Father, are you satisfied? And God smiles and says, Son, I'm satisfied. It's the blood of the new covenant. And God says, No longer will I meet you at the ark of the covenant on the mercy seat here. I will meet you people at the cross where the perfect sacrifice lamb of God will shed his blood and his blood will be upon the mercy seat. People, that's incredible. I think we need to just take a moment. Lord, this is incredible, man. Thank you. We stand on holy ground right now. And we think of the shed blood of Jesus. 
We think of our own failures. <laughs> she gave us the law. We couldn't pull it off. We couldn't obey it even to the least percentage. And you demanded that we obey it perfectly. We could not. But your heart of love and compassion and, and mercy acknowledged that. So you came up with a better promise. A promise of Jesus. The Lamb of God who through his shed blood will take away the sin of the world. Now that's a better promise if ever I heard one. And that better promise overwhelms the old promise. That promise of the new covenant does end and makes it obsolete, as the passage, passage says, because now we have purchased with the blood of Jesus. Jesus has presented that to you, Father, and you have accepted completely his blood atonement. And for that, we thank you. Have you accepted it, people? Man, you've got to accept the, the blessing that comes from the second covenant. And it comes as you come into relationship with God. Guys, I've got a long way to go. <laughs> they were really hoping for a shorter sermon. I've still got 18 minutes and 25 seconds according to this. Okay. Let me talk to you now. If that was the old covenant, let me talk to you about what the new covenant looks like. I, I, I love the idea of the glory of God coming out over here, the glory of God shining. But a new covenant is based upon a foundation, a very powerful foundation. This is the new covenant. If you look in the passage there, you will read about that which makes it new. It's not based about the rules anymore, because that was this. It's based upon a relationship. A relationship with God. God says, you couldn't cut it with the rules, but I still am crying out for a relationship with you that I will now have through Jesus. And then in verse 12, now I want to start at the end of the passage and build my story from there. So if you've got your Bible in front of you, we're going to start at verse 12. And verse 12 speaks about forgive and forget. Now I'm not talking to you about that. I'm talking to you about God doing that. Because your forgiveness of one another for the things around you, that's one thing. But God's forgiveness toward you is yet another thing. And God says, I want to forgive and I will forget your sins and I will remember them no more. We'll come back to that in a moment. And then we go back to verse 11. We're up the pile here. We go, and then God says, and you will know me. You won't just know about me. You will know me. This is the personal nature of this relationship. We talk about knowing God. We know an awful lot about him, and we'll read a little bit of that just now. And then out of that, God says, when you know me, I will renew you. He says it's all about your mind and your heart. That's what you'll find in verse 10. And then out of the renewal that God does in your mind and in your heart, you develop an assurance which is also verse 10, which is an assurance that you know God and He knows you. And there's that beautiful thing where that mysterious union between God's Spirit and your Spirit becomes something that you just know in your heart that I have connected with God. And even though I may sin, I know that God and I are still connected. It's a mysterious union when God says, my Spirit will join with your Spirit and I will give you the assurance that you are a child of God. And then out of that comes a sense of maturity. Where God says, hey, in the old covenant, I led the people by their hands. I took them by the hand and I walked them through the wilderness. Now you are mature and you will know me and the people that you, you talk to, they will also know me. And it's not about knowing the law anybody. It's about now, it's about a relationship where we get to know God. So let's talk about this particular aspect of what we're talking about here. This is the new covenant. Let's talk about this. We understand the foundation is simply upon Jesus. He is the foundation. 
Okay. Then we move up here, and God says, until you have forgiveness from me, you do not have anything. So upon this desire for a new relationship, there needs to be a forgiveness of our sins. This means we have to come in humility, and we have to repent of our sin to God. If you sneak past this thing, do you know what I mean? It's, it's not going to last. You're not going to sustain it. There has to be a brokenness as you acknowledge your own sinful nature. And as you come to God, you, 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 you come with humility and you say, God, forgive me. And God says, it's done. It's done. And then God says, not only have I forgiven you, but I've forgotten your sin as well. <laughs> I find it intriguing how often we remind God about how bad we are. We say, God, you, you know, Lord, I did a really bad thing about 20 years ago, you know, and I, and I just can't live with that. And we're thinking, we're thinking in our heads that God remembers. And if you were to say to God, God, I want to talk to you about that thing. And God said, what thing? Oh, God, you can't rem remember about 20 years ago, I really messed up badly. And God says, sorry, I don't remember that. It's all forgiven. And people, it is forgotten. Later on in the passage where you see that it talks about having a clear conscience, that's a better promise. Where God says, not only do I forgive and forget your sin, but I'm going to give you a clear conscience. You need a clear conscience today? You need to talk to God about that. Because He didn't just come to take your sin away. He came to take your guilt and your shame and your guilty conscience as well. If all He's done is take your sin, you've only taken half. There is a better promise on that. That God says, I am going to give you a clear conscience. I had a chat with a guy recently, and uh, he was very, very sick. We were talking about salvation, and uh, he asked me a question. He said, Trevor, I don't have very long to go, but how, uh, how do I know if I'm forgiven? How do I know that this is gonna, has happened for me? And my answer to him was simply, you don't, because this is one of the aspects of trust. Where God says, here's a better promise. John 1, 1 John 1 verse 9 says, here's a better promise. If you confess my, your sin, I will be faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now that, people, is a better promise. And you've got to believe the better promise of God. And that assurance will be that God has indeed forgiven you. So the question is, I don't know, but I'm still trusting that God will be faithful to his promise, his better promise, and indeed he will. And then you go up to think to those who want to know me. Now we all go to Sunday school, or we hope we did, and we get to learn a whole lot of things of characteristics of God. We learn to know that from Psalm 139 or many other places that God is omniscient. That means that God knows everything. One of his characteristics. Thou hast searched me and you know me. You understand my down sitting and my upstanding. You know my thoughts from afar. Before I even speak a word, you know what I'm about to say. God knows it all. There's nothing that God does not know. And so we see that as a characteristic of God. And we tick that box and we say, yeah, I know about that. I know about that. And then we say, okay, then out of that thing, Psalm 139 goes on to say, even though I go to the utmost parts of the sea, and if I go to the depth of the sea and the other side of the ocean, if I go to the heights of heaven and the depths of hell, even there you will be there. You're, you encamp around me. You plant a hedge around me. You know exactly where I am all the time because God is omnipresent. That's a fact. We know that about God. It's one of his characteristics. And then it goes on in Psalm 139 to say, to say this. He says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Before I was even conceived, you knew me. Before I was even conceived in my mother's womb, you knew me. And you took the DNA from two people. You put it together and you made me. Now, we can create a lot of things by human beings, standards. But we can't give life to anything. Only God can do that. Only he who is omnipotent can do that kind of stuff. And so we know a lot about God, do we not? We know characteristics of God. We know about his holiness. But holiness, holiness is actually more of his character than his characteristic. We understand the holiness of God. We read about Isaiah going in and seeing the Lord high and lifted up. And he cried, the angels were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They were crying holy because that's who God is. In characteristic and in character, God is holy. And then in Isaiah 5, verse 16, we see he will show himself holy by his righteousness. So holiness of God and his righteousness kind of go hand in hand. The one is evidence of the other. 
And in Psalm 119, it says, His righteousness endures forever. You know why? Because He endures forever. And so you're sitting there right now, and you say, yeah, Trevor, I know that. Yeah, 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 cool. Tick that box. Yeah, I get that one right. I know about His omniscience. I know His omnipresence. I know all that stuff. And we know a lot about God, but He's not talking about that. He says, you will know me, because knowing me is based upon a relationship that Jesus has established. Well, let me ask. You may not know a lot about him, but that's okay. But do you know him? Do you know him? Can you honestly say you do? And then when you know him, I love this part, where we see how, how there are better promises that uh, we read how, how they will know him simply because God, there's a passage, 2 Corinthians 5.12, it says this, God made himself who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You have no righteousness of your own. God has to give you his righteousness. You know, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel's a prophet in the Old Testament, intriguing character, an amazing prophecy. But there's a distinctive throughout the book of Ezekiel, and it says this, that you may know the Lord. That's what it, over and over again. God did this, that you may know the Lord. God said that, that you may know the Lord. God, you know, it was just one thing after another. I, I was going to count how many times it said this, but I, it was just too much to count. That you may know the Lord because God has done something, and that He does that in order that you may know Him. But do we know Him? We know a lot about Him, but I want you to know, do we know Him? Philippians 3.10 says that we may know him by the power of his resurrection. It's difficult to know a dead person, hey? I've got dead, and I don't get any response. You've got to really know that guy. You can know about him. You can know his history. You can know his heritage. You can know what legacy he left behind. But you're not going to know him because he's dead. And it says here that we know Jesus because of the power of his resurrection and because you know him, because he lives in you, John 14, 17 says, we can know him personally. And that's the journey of a legitimate Christian experience is to get up every day and to say, God, I want to know you better. I want to know you better by your characteristics and your character. I know those things because I can tick them off, I can read. But God, I just want to know you. This is why Mary and Martha are so important. Martha's working away in the kitchen, doing lots of good stuff, I'm sure. But Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet and saying, Jesus, I want to know you. Jesus, tell me about you. Jesus, tell me what I need to know so that I can know you personally. That's an exciting adventure for the Christian experience and that is a better promise. Let's move on. Verse 11 also speaks about the renewing of our mind. You know, in the law, we find that the, the law was a written thing, and the law was written in a book. And now God says, I'm not going to write it in a book anymore. I'm going to write it in your heart. And then he goes on to say, my law is written in your heart. And then he goes on to say, but a better promise is my laws will be whispered in your heart and in your mind. You see, he, he wrote with a pen the laws in the old, New, old Covenant. And now he writes them by the Holy Spirit in your mind and in your heart. You are the tablet of stone that God is writing. And the whisper of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your mind, as God deals with you directly. Isn't that wonderful? We have the beauty of the Bible, the written word, but God has a whispered word that he would whisper into your heart and into your mind. That's a better promise. And then we have assurance going up the pole here. I will be their God and they will be my people, verse 10. Now remember that the old covenant was old because it was written to Israel specific that this was the nation that God had chosen. And the beauty of the new covenant is that it's not just written to Israel, it's written to us. Gentiles are now included. For God so loved the, the Israelites that he gave his only son. No, 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 no. For God so loved the world <laughs> that he gave his only begotten son. People, it's incredible. That's the assurance we have. Because now no longer is it just for a group of people, it's for all of us. Now, the better promise is this. Romans 8, 15. 
For you did not receive a spirit that makes us a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Spirit of God himself testifies with my spirit. That's that union I was talking about, that we are children of God. And then out of the assurance that we have that we are children of God, we come to the crowning glory of maturity. Maturity, where we will know God, where He will work in His mind, He will write His laws upon our hearts and upon our minds, and that we will have renewal in these things. We will have assurance that we are who He says we are, not who we think we are. We are His children. And out of that, live that for a little length of time, and suddenly you find, here's maturity. The old covenant, I look back, says this, verse 9, I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they weren't faithful. He said, this is God, the old covenant saying, you guys have messed up so badly, I have to take you by the hand like a child. You know, when a kid is small, we lead him by his or her hand. And God's saying, that's because you're immature. But as believers, having gone through this process, we don't need God to lead us by his hand because he leads us through his spirit in our hearts. Can you understand that? This is terribly mystical. But I've got to tell you, the more mystical we make it, the more real it can become. Because God speaks to us a better promise. Here's what the better promise is. You want fruitfulness, which is what maturity is all about. A vine tree, the older it gets, the more fruit it produces if it's cared for. Jesus, on the way to Gethsemane, meets the disciples in the, in the garden. And he looks at the vine and he says, Hey guys, I'm the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me will bear much fruit. There's different categories of fruit. Some people bear no fruit. God says, I'll cut that off. Some people just bear fruit, and some people bear more fruit, and some people bear much fruit determined by the state of your maturity. You want to bear fruit for God? You don't start here. You start here. Build a relationship with Jesus through the new covenant and His new better promises. Find forgiveness from God for your sin. Then you get to know Him, His character, His characteristics are wonderful. And you don't just know about Him, you know Him, you meet with Him every day. You get up and you talk to Him. And then you renew your spirit and in your heart. You get the assurance of your salvation that you are a child of God. And then out of that grows this over a period of time. Incredible maturity from no fruit to some fruit to much fruit. Because that's what maturity does. So that's the better promises of the new covenant. Now I need to close. Let me ask you this very quickly. When they had the old covenant, they would put it in the temple, they would put it in the Holy of Holies, and they put it behind a veil so you couldn't see it. Now Jesus came and he says, now the new covenant is available to everybody. And at his death, you all know that the temple curtain was torn in two, and a great invitation was given for you and for me to come into the Holy of Holies. It's a beautiful promise of God. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then, let us then approach the throne of God with confidence, not arrogance, with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. People, the veil has been torn. The Ark of the Covenant is there. The door is open. And all that awaits now is for you to avail yourself of God's invitation. I hope you won't disappoint him by not taking him up on his invitation. I did that once in a worldly context. You know, back in my military days, I was invited with a group of other guys to go to the president's house for dinner. It was a real honor. Crunch of about 10 of us, we were invited to his place for dinner. And I was very nervous about going to his house because I thought, what am I going to do? What's he, what do I say to the president? How, how, do, I, how do I handle the eating utensils? What, what do I say? And this fear began to well up in my mind. And I, his house was close to the barracks. So the ten of us get ourselves all dressed up, ready to go. And we get to walk down to his house. <laughs> and when we get outside the presidential mansion up in Harare, we're standing there. And, and all of a sudden, I'm thinking, Phew, I don't know whether I should go in. So I said to my buddies, I said, I've got the invitation, the door is open, but you know what, guys, I, oh man, I, I forgot something. I'm just going to run back to the barrier quickly and get it. So I leave them, and they all go in. 
I came an hour later, I come back to the gate and I'm standing there and I'm looking and thinking, I've got the invitation, I've got the pass, I've got the credentials. Well, why don't I go in? So I walk up to the gate guy and he says, yeah, what do you want? I said, here's my invitation. He says, yeah, come on in. You're, you're legitimate. Come on in. And the guys are up in the house, go up there and have a good time. And I thought, man, I can't do that. What am I going to say? And fear has begun to well up in my heart that I said, I'll, I'll come back just now. And I went and sat across the road. I don't know how many times this poor security guy had to listen to me. I'd walk across there. He said, are you going to come in this time? I said, I'll be back in five minutes. And I spent the entire evening walking backwards. The door was open, for goodness sake, to a great feast with the president. And he's just a human being. Imagine how much huger this is with, 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 with God. And you know what happened that evening? After a couple of hours of this, this vacillating between the two, I just dried up and went home. I didn't even go. You know how I feel regretful about that today? That would look good on my CV, you know, that I had dinner with the president. But I can't write it because I never accepted his invitation. That's a stupid, pathetic example compared to the invitation God gives you into the Holy Holies to take on the new covenant. The old one is done. A new one based upon a relationship with Jesus. Folk, if, if you have never done that, I don't want to waste this theological study by just making it kind of theology and, and interesting words. I want to ask you, if you would like to know Jesus like this, there's going to be people sitting and go through the prayer room door at the side over there, and there'll be a bunch of guys waiting to pray with you, just to chat with you, if that's what you would like. But don't leave from here not having done the deal. Let's pray. Father, we're so aware that we really need you. We're so aware, God, of, of the old covenant, of our failure, and of our guilt, and of our shame, because we can't keep the law. Our sinful nature is just so strong, and the bias in our minds towards sin is just so overwhelming. Thank you, God, that you understand that. And that now you have given us a better promise of Jesus and a better promise of the Holy Spirit and a better promise of forgiveness and a better promise of assurance of salvation, a better promise that we could bear fruit for you one day. It's just one long series of better promises. But it all starts with a relationship with you as a result of the new covenant. And the Old Testament was so complicated. It was so complicated. All the ornateness and the laws and the rituals and the sacrifices. You've simplified it down completely now. The new covenant is just based upon the cross where you say you will meet us and we will meet with Jesus. That's where the journey begins. That's where the new covenant takes over from the old God. I pray that today everyone sitting in this church would identify with what I've just said in Jesus' name. Amen.